Joe Couchette, Joe Couchette, I was president of TLPJ back in 1986. I think we had been around about four or five years at that time, uh, maybe uh, five or six. And it was a great honor. We had some terrific people from all across the country. I was a young lawyer uh, practicing then about 10 years. And we brought in some very aggressive young lawyers that were very interested in uh, social democracy. By that, I mean the social movement uh, as it could be brought about by litigation. And that's how we came up with the name Trial Lawyers for Public Justice. It was our uh, bent on giving young lawyers an opportunity to get into the courtroom or find the courtroom on issues where before I had not been challenged. And it was a remarkable group of people who started out. And I was very honored to be named the president after a couple of years. I was not only there from the beginning, I remember... Uh, the first year in uh, operation, uh, we had some disagreements, as you would with any young trial lawyers, as to what direction to go. It, there was some very heated, argumentative, but always coming together in the end of a uh, decision as to where and what cases we should take on. So let me tell you, in my opinion, uh, what really got us going. It was a case up in, uh, up in Boston, and that's why I wish I had the names of the past presidents. A, uh, it was kind of a flood case that damaged uh, a lot of homes. And while we were very interested in helping the community, it was a minority community, uh, we eventually got into the civil rights movement. And in the early 80s, uh, I received a call from Ted Kennedy and a member of his staff about the killing of Viola Liuzzo back in the 19, 1965 era. And that was, uh, remember the Selma Bridge March? She had been killed, and it turned out that through some investigation that the FBI, an FBI informant killed Viola Liuzzo. Well, the trial lawyers for public justice, we came together and uh, decided that was a case we were going to take on. Uh, I led the charge. I was, I think, lead counsel. We had three or four other people from trial lawyers for public justice. But the fact of the matter is, the whole group of us worked together. We went down to Alabama. We investigated. We eventually tried the case. And that was the case that really got us off the ground. And the issue was the killing of Viola Liuzzo in 1965 in the Selma March. And what was so interesting about the case is that it turned out with testimony before the Kennedy Committee in the Senate was that an FBI informant had actually killed Viola Liuzzo. And that's really the case. We spent a lot of time, all of us, J.D. Lee, Dean Robb, Dan Sullivan from Seattle. Uh, we spent time in Alabama digging up information from the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, from the FBI. It was quite a case. It was nationally followed. And we ended up trying it up in Michigan. The case got sent up to Michigan for trial. We lost the case, but it changed the whole way the FBI uh, operated their informants' procedures. And I think that's the, the case, along with a couple of others that came later, that really put trial lawyers for public justice on the map. And what I mean, what I mean to say by put them on the map is it got a lot of lawyers, great lawyers around the country, interested, and they understood at that point but that by coming together, all working together, they could make some terrific changes. In the past, in your community, if you wanted to bring a civil rights case, you did it through your own firm. Uh, the Viola Liuzzo case was a group of firms. We decided who would be trial lawyer, who would be the discovery lawyer, who would work with the FBI, who would take the depositions of the Ku Klux Klan down in uh, Alabama. It was quite a case. And what it did was it gave a reasoning uh, for being part of TLPJ. And I got to tell you, everybody who started out, it was such an honor to work with these people. When you talk about Dean Robb, Dean Robb coming out of Michigan truly 
was one of the key lawyers in Michigan that uh, that worked with African Americans in Detroit. Dan Sullivan up in Seattle. Uh, J. D. Lee in the South. I think J. D. was from either Alabama somewhere. And uh, th those were lawyers that just had the guts and the integrity to really put together TLPJ. It was such an honor to work with them. Bill Trine, thank you so much. Bill Trine, I think, followed me as president and uh, really took it to another level in the sense that his commitment was extraordinary. And he really pulled all of us along. So in those days when public justice was, or at that time, trial lawyers for public justice was doing a case, it was litigated by people like yourself who were board members, as opposed to the way public justice operates today with an enormous in-house group of very talented lawyers. It was the Viola Liuzzo case and a couple of other cases, one up in Boston that really put the organization on the map. By being on the map, I mean, it gave lawyers from around the country a sense of joining and being able to work with other lawyers, which they hadn't been able to do before that. And we got into a number of cases in the South where we took on uh, voting issues where people obviously, not obviously, primarily African-Americans were discriminated against and stopped from voting. Uh, we got into some uh, brutality cases where at the voting booth, uh, people would be beat up and assaulted. We got into some cases involving school districts, uh, which was very interesting, how they tried to segregate school districts. So we filed a couple of those. And remember, once we would file the case, we were very fortunate because that would bring in other groups. So it was really leading the charge is what it was really all about was having the guts to go file a case where other people wouldn't do it. I will tell you that uh, I spent a couple of nights in a safe house in Alabama where we would have death threats. And to be honest with you, uh, they always said they were all coming from the KKK. I'm not sure that was the situation. But I do know that uh, but for the guts of a lot of people I worked with, we would never have had taking that case on. Of course, Ralph in those days was, was basically about safety of automobiles. That's how Joan Claybrook came into it. But you know, that was just a small portion of what TLPJ did. And that's, I guess, why we got rid of the trial lawyer's name, as you pointed out, because we did not become popular with corporate America. We took on corporate America when the Department of Justice was many times in bed with corporate America. Uh, I don't care, Democrat, Republican, what administration you had. I remember going to Washington many, many times uh, to uh, testify before Congress and or to meet with elected officials as to what they had to do. You use the word courage. Yes, there was courage, but I, I, I want to move away from courage to more into a, uh, a word of... Um, of integrity, uh, the lawyers that I worked with, the J.D. Lees, the Bill Trines, uh, it, it, it was more than courage. It was really great integrity in the process. And they wanted to use the legal process to see if they couldn't bring about social change. And yes, there was a lot of cur encouragement needed, and there was a lot of uh, courageous people, and you're right about that but I would put the word integrity before I would put the word courage. Uh, and that's some of the arguments we used to get into, believe it or not, at our uh, board meetings as to what cases we wanted to take on. This is another thing that was so interesting, that most of us around that table at the outset were veterans. And that's a very important point, because back in the 70s, we had just come out of Vietnam. Uh, I had been a, a special forces officer, uh, did 12 airborne operations uh, while I was in the reserves and on active duty. And I looked around that table and I can tell you there were a lot of people sitting at that table that were uh, heavily into having served their country as a veteran. And then eventually we got into some younger people who, uh, who hadn't been in the service, 
but still had the guts and the integrity uh, to carry on the operation. I want to talk just for a moment about the early staff. I think our first executive director was a guy by the name of Tony Roisman, who was fabulous. He virtually worked for nothing in D.C., and by nothing I mean uh, what we paid him was very little. Uh, and he built that staff with heart and integrity, brought in a young man by the name of Arthur Bryant, I believe, who really became the guts of moving on and taking over Tony's role. Uh, I think Arthur Bryant, when you interview him, he will tell you uh, what a uh, wild bunch we had sitting around that table. Arthur came out of a very interesting background uh, that uh, wasn't used to a couple of uh, airborne nuts like myself telling him what to do, et cetera, et cetera, because we didn't mince a lot of words. You couldn't. Uh, if you were taking on the FBI for their conduct in the Viola Luzo case and or other cases of voting rights, you were taking on some very powerful people. And you had to have people with a lot of guts and a lot of integrity to do that. We package a group of uh, some pretty aggressive lawyers, for lack of a better word. And for the Tony Roismans and the Arthur Bryants, who had to put up with them, we owe them a lot for keeping us all together. You know, Joe, as you're talking about the civil rights cases in those days and having to spend a couple of nights in the safe house, I've always been struck by the amount of courage it took for everyone who's ever done any of that sort of work, uh, obviously going back to the 50s and 60s also, the amount of courage it took. But but I once uh, saw a terrific live interview with John Lewis and, and Dr. C.T. Vivian uh, conducted by uh, Skip Gates from Harvard. And they were, someone asked about courage and, and they, they both said, well, no, it, it wasn't courage. It was just something we had to do. It wasn't a question of courage or not. We, we couldn't live unless we did this. It was that important. We didn't think about it in terms of courage or not courage. But, you know, for someone like me, looking back on it as, as history and, and, and being a little bit younger than you, Joe, and, uh, you know, I certainly see it as courage and have so much admiration for people like you who are willing to, 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 to do that, that work that needed to be done. I, I'm, I'm curious about something else. Uh, you touched on earlier, you, you talked about how the civil rights cases and the voting rights cases were so important at the beginning. I'm curious, though, about uh, what kind of consumer protection work was done at the beginning. I assume Ralph Nader's involvement at the beginning had, had some influence on that. It's an interesting point about that you're all veterans, I, I, or most of you. I, I, I was not aware of that, and it, and it is an, an interesting observation. Brought on some very interesting people to this. Uh, everyone around that table had served their country in one way or another, whether they had a uniform on or not. Uh, the uniform was part of serving the country, but there were many great people there that boycotted, as they should have properly, uh, that Viet Vietnam fiasco. Arthur's role was following Tony, keeping us organized. And I, again, I want to go back to the fact that so many of us in the early days had a personality or a role in life that was very aggressive. And to get 10 of us in a room, the poor Tonys and Arthurs had to keep us all talking to each other for lack of a better description or a better word. I started out in 1980, or whatever year it was, we started the group. And I think I stayed active for about 20 years. And then, of course, moved into other groups here on the West Coast. The traveling stopped, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and we put together groups regionally. So a lot of the TLPJ people, trial lawyers for public justice, were able then to start their own regional groups. We did one in Los Angeles. We did one up here in the Bay Area. Seattle had a terrific group of people that brought the same cases that TLPJ was bringing. In other words, TLPJ was the leader that really set the goals or gave the roadway for groups to operate. It's probably the leading group in the country that sheds light on the uh, problems we have. I can't think of any other group. Yes, there's the ACLU. 
Yes, there's the Sierra Club, uh, who are all wonderful groups that we all belong to. They want to save our rights, want to save our environment. But I, I just have to tell you that the TLPJ, Trial Lawyers for Public Justice, really gave backbone to the ACLU. For example, the ACLU was started, what, 7,500 years ago. If I'm not mistaken, it's an older group. But it didn't really, it couldn't get out there and do the litigation that TLPJ did. And that was the key. The TLPJ lawyers, all of whom are a little wacky in their own sense, uh, really stood up and said, wait a minute, we're going to take this on. And that gave the Sierra Club, the National Legal Defense Fund, uh, NRLD, uh, RD, uh, resources, excuse me. It gave all of these groups the, I don't want to say the guts, it gave them a path to follow, if you will. So while we started with civil rights and equitable rights for people in the, in the 80s, uh, today, many of these fabulous groups took an inspiration from those people and now we're taking on Wall Street, Detroit, uh, the oil industry, big pharma, pharmaceutical. We didn't touch the pharmaceutical industry in TLPJ early on. We were out on the streets fighting. Now, as a result of those people, TLPJ, you got these wonderful groups looking out for a big, bigger group of citizens in our country.